Yeah, so my name is Jeremiah Henson. I'm from Hopkins. I'm a physician and a researcher there. Um, I work closely with Scott. We have a center for data science where we have a bunch of clinicians and engineers working together, um, kind of bringing uh, two things to the table. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, so I'm Christian. I work with Maya and Ian at Stanford. I'm a clinical informaticist. I'm one of the people that did the test after taking a, doing a fellowship at Stanford as well. And I focus a lot on human-centered uh, AI implementations and informatics generally. Uh, Maya Yadam. I am not an informaticist. I'm a researcher. I started my career in administration, emergency department operations, transitioned into looking at patient outcomes specifically. I do patient outcomes oriented research uh, and interventions in that space are usually around AI and so really translating models into clinical practice, hence participation in this group. So we're switching to a little less technical uh, uh, talk and talking about a concept that will really apply whether you're doing data science or other things. Um, you may have seen this. We'll see if it plays and has yeah. some. <laughs> Is it going to work? Like I never know when the videos will play or not. Or it'll just be an awkward picture of it. Yeah, just be an <laughs> awkward picture. <laughs> <laughs> that was the point. Yeah, we need a fun. Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the internet better, better be now. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, That's such a great movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Imagine. Does anybody watch I Think You Should Leave? Have you seen it? Yeah. All right, what, well, the, so what would happen here is that he, he has a job interview. The we guy has a job interview. He's very, is it working? No. Yeah. No, okay, good. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's fine. We'll go to the next one. Yeah. So he, the guy has a job interview. It seems to have gone okay. He's an awkward guy, like many of us, maybe. But uh, after the interview, he says, oh, I had a great time. And he walks to the door, and he, uh, he pulls the door, but it doesn't pull and push it. Right? But if you look at what he's pulling on, it's very clearly a handle. So um, if you think about like everyday life and how, how things uh, work, we've all done this, right? Um, you've encountered doors like this. Why does that door that says push have handles on it? It makes absolutely no sense. There should be no handles there. Uh, same thing over here. Why does the one that very clearly looks like a push label uh, have a pull? Uh, so if you just look around, you see these things everywhere. Uh, they have a name. They're called uh, Norman doors. They're named after this guy who's Don Norman. He, is the father of user-centered design. Um, and, he, and he talks about a lot of things. And if you want to go down a YouTube uh, wormhole of watching uh, cool lectures that are entertaining, you can watch his stuff. Uh, but the, the central thing is that if you're going to create something for a, a, a person, a human being, it should be discoverable. Like, you should not need a sign that says, push this door or pull this door. You should walk up to the door and do the right thing. Uh, and and it should be you should be able to understand what you're supposed to do with something. So the door is not as good of an example, but I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, had a, one of these new fancy uh, flat screen TVs and lost the remote and can't turn it off. I have one in my bedroom. It's very frustrating. It's, you cannot turn it off without the remote. Uh, so uh, if you do, you have to like get behind it and it's mounted to the TV. So it has to be understandable and you have to be able to move forward. It's the same thing with data science and, and when we're pushing technology out into the clinical environment. So there's these fields, you'll see all sorts of different things. Um, User-centered design, human-centered design, UX, HX, UI. It's all for us. Like if, if there are designers in the room, I apologize. Uh, but for us, it's all essentially the same thing. Um. And basically, all of these things, too, I gave a lecture about like innovation thinking. And they're, they're all the same sort of process. There's like proprietary ones that IDO has or different universities that uh, design school at Stanford has their own. They all kind of iterate on the same thing. So we'll just choose the one on the right to go through today, the human-centered design process, and focus on defining a problem, which we did at the beginning of today. We're, all of us, even in the little sessions, we should be thinking about a problem and, and why we think it's a problem. And then once you've sort of defined what your problem is, you then should research it. Um, and figure out why that's happening. Then you'll <laughs> ideate solutions and prototype and eventually test. And we'll get through each of these concepts here. So again, this is supposed to be a 30,000 foot view. You've heard a lot of the different parts of where to get data, data infrastructure, how to define your problem. And now we're gonna bring it together with parts of implementation science, design thinking, in that middle frame we were talking about before where a lot of the meat uh, and potatoes gets in. Let's see, we can talk about the... Yeah, so, um one thing that we've had success with, and you also talk a bit about um, how do you get someone to adopt a tool even if it works, right? Even if we step outside of this and we go down the, down the uh, hallway to talk about anything, uh, any tool that you're trying to deploy in the uh, clinical environment, the first reaction is like not wanting to 
have a change happen. So one thing that that you can do is you you pair up with the people who are actually uh, living the experience that you're trying to improve, and you design the solution with them. They're not going to be doing all of the uh, data pipeline and machine learning building, but they will uh, help you design how that interface could happen and exactly how you address the problem and whether uh, AI is the way that they, they want that problem addressed. And so it's called co-design, where you, you bring uh, experts in a particular domain together with the people who, who you're trying to help, and you design the solution together, whether that's the technical design, and we've actually done some work where it's, we call it like user-centered data science, where you're bringing people in together to help you understand how to build a tool, or whether you're designing the interface for them, uh, both things are, are pretty important. And I can maybe add in a just a, a concrete example of how this can really be critical in designing how you fix the problem. Um, we had looked at during EKG time and realized that patients who did get their EKGs on time and those who didn't were demographically very different. Um, and in fact, those who had delays looked like many of our vulnerable populations who really worked hard to try and address their needs in a way that's equitable for others who are not. We started talking to sort of who gets the door to EKG. Um, and we talked to triage nurses. It happens before us. We'll talk to the nurses and see what they're doing. The nurses said, we train on this. We're really good at this. Maybe we need to retrain. So we watched their workflow and actually realized the only person who reliably meets a patient within 10 minutes is the registration clerk. They're working in a different computing system. They're not clinically trained. They're often following very rudimentary instructions. When we looked at what they were given, it looks nothing like how we're trained as clinicians to identify patients for an EKG. So our solution became completely different than what we had planned. And that came from really having all of our stakeholders involved. And this uh, next picture here is just to say, these are concepts that we encounter all the time, right? You can, like city, city planners will come in. Uh, you see this on a, a college campus where you design a path and, and you have a, a plan that you would like people to follow, but it doesn't matter what your plan is, they're gonna do what they're gonna do, right? So if you can understand what that is before, you can make a better plan. So the, on the left, both of these are, users have just uh, decided where they're going to go. On the right, there is some co-design happening, but it seems to be after the fact, right? So if we, can, if we could design it that way in the beginning, then we would have a tool that was much easier to use and, and we could uh, promote uptake of it. These also, are, Desire real co-design process was making these slides in action across the group. So just, you know, That's true, every yeah. day, little yeah. little co-design elements. We're, I mean, we are currently we're co-designing how we're delivering this lecture yeah. as we go. Yeah. This was a meta experiment. Um, I think this slide, you know, really just gets at. I, do you have any idea what to do here? Does anybody know what, like if this was presented to you, when I first started yeah. doing informatics, it was on clinical yeah, decision right. support. <laughs> I, I like how snooze for two hours is on the same level as yeah. not on primary care team. Like I don't know how those are related, how yeah, they got next know, to I'm each other. I'm, I'm never on the primary care team. <laughs> yeah. And then whether or not you can just. Not on primary care team, maybe yeah. 100,000 times. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, and then the the amount of times when I studied it was like seventy percent of the people didn't choose anything; they just clicked out because you had the like close box button. You know, and I was like, it doesn't matter. So a huge element to this is just understanding what people need to do to make the decision you want them to make when you want them to make it, and when's the right time to do that in the first place. And lastly. How do you even present that information? Lots of people get into, should something be green? Should something be red? Should it be on the top right, lower left? You know, All these elements are up for grabs, but it's up to you guys ultimately to, to make a decision and then to do it in a, in a way that's authentic to whoever you're, um, you, you're making this solution for. Which I think, to Maya's point too, is it's about like the patient and patient safety and getting to uh, the outcome that you actually want. Um, there's an example in the news about, uh, if anybody paid attention recently, about the nurse who um, was has uh, yeah. criminal time, which has to do with the Vecuronium versus Versed. And when I talked to my nurse colleagues about it too, they had a lot of strong feelings and were going over bottles, labeling where in the Pixis they would get something from, how that would happen, alphabetizing. You see here some examples of color coding, having specific tops, what needs to be reconstituted. There's all sorts of ways in which the design process actually is hugely important for helping someone not make this mistake of going, oh, of course, I just take the drug. The drug starts with VE. I, I grab it and I deliver it to the patient. You know, They're very specifically designed to have different caps, labeling, layout, um, in order to prevent some of the human errors. There was something else you were going to add to that. I, I put this in there, and then the, <laughs> the shift before I came here, so like uh, 18 hours ago, uh, I repaired a laceration, and the nurse had given me lidocaine. Uh, later on, we had a critical care patient in the same room, and she said, 
why did you why did you not use this lidocaine and gave me back the lidocaine? Which I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take this home and I'll use it if my kids need some lidocaine. And I looked down and it was succinylcholine. Oh my and god. I was like, oh my god, yes. Yeah. So, so it's very, very easy to do these things. And I think it's important for us to always think about like how can our tools that we develop hurt a patient, right? So that, that's what we always should think about, like is not, not only can we help, but what could we hurt as well as we're doing it. Yeah. So the first step in any of this, like you said, is just defining the problem. We won't spend too much time on that, but that is one of, you know, we're at the site of academic emergency physicians defining the problem uh, is like the bread and butter. If you don't have that, you know, it's gonna be a little bit harder to pass uh, to pass go. And saying so, you know, there's a filler slide. We were gonna choose syncope as an example to work through for people, but I think we've sort of, um, we've moved on from that uh, conceptually for the rest of uh, today. Um, so <laughs> the second step, um, after you've sort of you know, stated whatever your problem is, um, the second step is to determine uh, where the problem lies or to research the problem and the potential solution spaces. And so for me, has anyone here heard of like, you know, for root cause analyses, which is how you try to determine where your problem is and what's causing it? Have you heard of the five whys? Everybody here? No? The five whys are basically a concept that are, there's like the prime example of them is the Jefferson Memorial, which was the problem that was presented um, to a group was the Jefferson Memorial is deteriorating faster than we anticipate. It's for unclear reason we're having to like use more uh, chemicals to continue to wash the building and, and what's going on there. And someone said, well, uh, why are we using more chemicals on the building? I said, oh, because it has a ton of uh, bird droppings on it and we're always having to clean off. There's all this like residue. I said, well, why is there so much bird dropping on here? And they go, oh, because the birds, they come and they uh, like eat all the insects which live nearby. And they're like, well, why are there so many insects near the Jefferson Memorial? And they're like, oh, because they have a bunch of lights on them. And so because there are so many lights on them, there's all these mosquitoes and flies and spiders that live nearby that live there at these hours. And they go, well, why are the lights on all the time? And then they were like, well, because we assumed it's Washington, D.C. We should have the lights on the monument, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, and ultimately the solution, the like design-centered solution for that was to limit the lighting and uh, cut down by like greater than 30% the amount of erosion they were seeing to like the Jefferson uh, Monument. I did find out though that this example may or may not be for the Jefferson <laughs> Memorial, that apparently that's how I was told it in medical school and informatics five wise class, but it could, it's like any memorial is used as an example for this. So I don't know, this one seemed to have a, <laughs> yeah, could be, I guess, they just insert whichever one is more important to them at the time. Um, so the ways to do this though, you know, there's many ways to drill down. There's many ways to do root cause analysis. Just starting easy to me, there's like, you can start with interviewing people. Just ask the people, ask physicians why this is a problem. Like Maya just said, just ask the, you know, pivotal players here, um, which I think is great. Uh, in theory, it has some biases, which is that it's recall, it's whatever the person perceives at their institution. It might not be transferable to other places. In theory, there could be a group that, you know, doesn't, you know, the, registration clerk. Maybe they take call-ins beforehand or something like that and you know, there might be a different place to work on the same, the same sort of problem. Um, if you're going to move past just interviewing people, you might want to directly observe them. And so has anybody had a, like, a direct observer of their clinical practice? Or, uh, it feels very odd but people just track and watch you do what you're doing as an emergency physician, which I said is kind of like feeling like you're being spied on all the time. There's always someone with like a, a clipboard or like a recorder while you do your work and it can be a little off-putting and that can lead to issues like the Hawthorne effect, which is the fact that you know you're being observed so your practice can be a little bit different. So you can wind up with some biases as to the problem there. Um, but today we move into the deep learning space and we've talked a little bit about cameras and some research that people are doing and trying to watch the clinical encounter and understand what's going on. Some of the research that I do is specifically in the space of like real world data, um, which is kind of like the real world TV show, I guess. You're just watching people exist in, I guess, real life situations and then recording what they do. Um, but as a refresher, Real world data in the clinical sense, we've talked a little bit about. We have our clinical data in the EHR. We have cost and utilization data, which we could use to understand how medicine is being practiced and where we need to intervene. We have patient-centered uh, data, wearables, and you know various phone, you know, um, apps and stuff. And you have public health data, and so you can use all of these to understand why is your problem a problem and where are some of the potential uh, solutions. 
Um, so for me, I wind up doing something called process mining, which is using the EHR data and the audit log data to see what clinicians are doing for different patients. One of the places we did this was on like on stroke care and understanding what happens in a code stroke or to get someone TPA. Obviously, it'd be great if we could like cut down time to TPA, but breaking that apart into each of its you know, confluence steps and understanding where bottlenecks might occur would help us to understand that is it recognizing a stroke when someone walks into the ED that's delaying our care or is it the fact that once that we've recognized it, mobilizing resources, clearing the CT scanner or getting the drug called up or whether or not the neurologist is able to like get onto a tele uh, neurology um, visit or something like that. There's very different ways in which you can see what's happening and where the problem is. For me, that also comes in, there's bottlenecks, but there's also things like just high variability. If all of us in the room do something different and our pathways are very different, we might say that's a good opportunity to inform people on what the, what the process should be or what the best way to direct care is. Yeah, for, for the variability piece, some, sometimes machine learning or AI tools can actually target that indirectly. So if you're providing support, you're not necessarily like a, a, a predictive support. Like I think this is going to happen to this person and I would suggest, like for our triage tool, we'd suggest a specific level. So you're, you're targeting variability by providing evidence-based support that is happening you know, in an automated way and is, is uniform. Um, when we get to this, this uh, part called I, ideate, where we're going through the cycle here, uh, this is where like the co-design really becomes important or at least has in our tools. And you got to be pretty open during this session. So we, we teamed up with the Maryland Institute College of Art for a grant where you know, we were looking at how we could develop technology-based solutions. And we got people into a room, and we didn't really give them any sorts of um, confines on how to solve a problem. Uh, we just gave a problem, and then we start to work through things. Uh, so these are uh, actually physicians and engineers all in a room together starting to think about a problem. I think this was one of you guys example of some process uh, mapping ideas of, of how a problem could be addressed. These are actual um, you know, pictures of uh, basically card stock that we would hand out and people would work at a, at a station and draw out what they think the solution would be, right? Some, a, a solution that they could do. So then we collect all of these solutions and we look at them and say, are any of these things that our team could do? Are, and, and we put them in a stack of like, you know, these are great ideas, but they belong to a different group. These are great ideas that belong to us, but they're not possible for us to do. And these are great ideas that belong to us that we could probably execute if we change it a little bit. And then we would have these physicians that we engaged in our project early on kind of present these ideas, talk about how they want, want to be. And then these people transition to be your, being your champions once the solution is deployed, right? Because that was their idea, right? And, 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 you, and you sell that throughout and, and talk about it, uh, and then they become a, a really good partner for you. Anything else for that section? No, okay. All right. So um, the next thing in this cycle, uh, and this cycle is very similar to many other cycles, like the PDSA cycle or systems engineering cycle. These cycles are very similar. Um, they just have different names. The next thing is to actually create something uh, because there's a paralysis often of like in the ideation, like yeah, I have this idea, I'm building a model and I'm doing this, but how am I gonna get it out there? You just have to start by doing something. And so this is, these are again pictures from uh, the same sort of, uh, um, the same project where we started by doing lo-fi lo um, replicas of what we would do. And they start out as paper, right? These things start out on paper and then they move into a design software and then we eventually end up with something real. In this one, we were uh, developing a smart dashboard, more or less. It's a feedback platform that gives you, and it's an emergency physician, all the information on the outcomes for every patient that you take care of and allows you to drill down and know when anything adverse happens to any patient that you take care of. And you two might use some Post-its later today. Yeah. So we'll all become <laughs> designers for a second. Uh, this is, a, um, this is a, a piece of... Uh, software or a, a decision support tool that Scott mentioned a little bit um, that we deployed in the clinical environment to support uh, disposition decision making for COVID uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So we had this new option that we could send people to a field hospital. We were having a hard time, if you think back to like two years ago, two and a half years ago when we started this, of knowing who's going to deteriorate, who's not going to deteriorate. Uh, and so we set out, we were actually asked by the hospital system to 
uh, help support those decisions and identify people that we could offload from the health system and send to the, the field hospital. And so we, we, we actually did, this is a, a, a paper which has, is under, it's in revisions for, for publication, but we sort of did a, 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 a co-design of the CDS with the clinicians and then a co-design all the way out until it, it got rolled out. And there are these five rights that we talk about uh, all the time in CDS, which is targeting the right person with the right information in the right format through the right channel, and it's often the EHR, but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, at the right point in the clinical workflow. And this is not perfect, but it was a pretty good example of something that worked because we kind of focused on that as we went through. The only other thing I'll say about this is uh, we've talked about how busy uh, emergency physicians are. Many of us are emergency physicians and know this, but uh, you know everybody in the emergency department is very, very busy. And so one thing that we have done is we're trying to achieve these things um, here in AI, which are challenging to do. How do we make a, an AI-supported tool uh, trustworthy? How do we give it transparency? How do we make it explainable? How do we make it usable? How do we deploy it in a respectful way? And sometimes the answer is not just one thing. So, so what we've tried to do with this particular tool is that you can interact with it in many different ways and at different depths. So if th what this tool does is you go in and you, you enter the disposition for a patient, so you've already decided that you're going to admit them uh, you may have decided that you're going to discharge them. And at that time, we then provide clinical information, and it does not interrupt you. It's just supplemental. And it tells you, hey, we identified this person as high risk for clinical deterioration within 72 hours or um, uh, you know, very specific things that we're telling them. They're either critically ill or we think they're going to need to be hospitalized. If you want to know more information about that, you click a hyperlink in that statement, and it would take you to a panel like this that tells you how the tool was developed, how well, well it performed, or it doesn't tell you how, here how well it performs, but it tells you how it was developed, what are the drivers of that, how the risk determinations are made. Uh, and then there's another hyperlink within this, and if you want to click on that, you can click out to a 10 minute video, and we give a presentation all about how we developed the tool, what the performance parameters are, how we're monitoring it, and you know, I don't ever want to watch that video again once I've watched it, but I had the opportunity to do it. And I don't want to read this every time I'm trying to disposition someone, but I would want to do it the first time. So you allow people to drill down and get more and more information, but not interrupt them with that all the time. And this is just to say that for prototyping, there's many different ways to do this as well. Um, Jeremiah was referencing, you know, you can use post-its, you can just draw things up. A huge part of coming up with a solution or engaging people is just to really think about what it can look like. And just this is an example of Figma as a free software. There's many different software suites out there. You do not need to use any of them, or you could do drawings on a piece of paper. But helping engineers and the people this is eventually going to get to, or the people that need to build your epic module, understand a workflow and draw it out for them actually has saved me a ton of time on projects um, because then they can copy it and make it real as opposed to this amorphous, we want to do. What, you know, X, Y, and Z, and we want people to be alerted wherever, it helps to just sort of start mapping it out. And so there's a bunch of resources available to you, which I highly encourage you to play around with even. Um, one is Figma, but you can search like other free design software tools. And something to consider as well is the framework that you're approaching your prototype. Because in some cases, the rigor that you need um, will drive whether or not you're ready to move forward with the prototype to see if it works. And so in some cases, you might have post-it notes and it's about changing a process that's already existing to modify something that launches into practice. And other times you need to actually look to see if it works before you can implement it into practice. Uh, and a lot, in, in when you're looking to see if something works, there's also the framework of is it operationally helping? Is your prototype designed to see if this idea operationalizes in, clini in the clinical environment? Or are you looking for an effect? Is it actually changing something that you're trying to target for improvement? And really the whole continuum of going from um, really operational process improvement to quality improvement where you're looking at some metric that might be operational to clinical research uh, will change that mind frame of how you approach the prototyping. Yeah, and basically that continuous process, the, the perfect um, segue into the fact that this is iterative, cyclical, and so researching the problem and then measuring your the implementation and seeing its effect on people and then seeing if you need to change it is ultimately, there's even a field, I don't know if you guys heard of de-implementation science, but it's not just about implementing, but also understanding what should stay, what needs to go. 
And so this is sort of the end of this cycle is you can directly observe people like earlier before, validate what's going on and see if it's having the impact you want it to have on your uh, end user, which is the physicians or the patient. You know, you, you might not care that the physician has an as a, you know, absolute, you know, stop and has to click through something if you're like it's going it is preventing this rare event that we really need to make sure is a never happen event um, in our hospital but you know just to turn that whole field just to give an intro to people if they haven't heard of that is implementation science and so again on the research side there are frameworks for this there's different ways there's a ton of different frameworks for this reaim is one precede proceed the consolidated framework for implementation research um, much like choosing the right intervention, you can try to look through various frameworks that are available on the NIH website for implementation science to understand how, what's the right way to evaluate whether or not a tool is working as well. And there's just many, as, you know, there's, I don't think any one is the right one. Just try to use those frameworks in the academic setting to understand what, whether what you're doing is having an impact that you want. Um, so I think we have one more talk, but then we'll get into uh, just doing this and thinking through these problems and uh, going from there. Any questions? want to, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Jeremiah has done even you know, much more work than I have in this space. One of the elements has been to like, almost in the running analogy, looking through the finish line and allotting or like very, being very specific about the first part of the implementation is not the end um, and sort of reframing from that. A lot of the implementation science researchers are like, the implementation itself is like the midpoint, you know, so pre-seed, proceed, and it comes a little bit with very much being very clear about the research question and determining whether or not you're improving <coughs> care for ACS patients will continue after the implementation and that feedback will dictate the ultimate solution. But I have a little bit of it has been reframing from like the finish is getting the tool done, the finish is improving the outcome, the problem that we defined from the beginning. And so the tool is just one of the avenues to get to that hopeful solution. Yeah. 
And yeah. I do think uh, I'll talk a little bit about governance next, but I think this is where like effective governance of these solutions comes in is that theoretically you shouldn't allow somebody to implement something in your health system unless they're committed to continuing to work on it in such a way that it's going to get better and we're going to make sure that it is working. There's also an interface between, like, it's very context specific. So we have, we wear like multiple hats. Uh, Scott and I are both part of the company as well. So when, when something goes out into a world and it's commercialized, you can rapidly change that because you're trying to, you know, optimize it for a customer need. Inside the clinical environment or academic environment where most of us work, we're all doing research and then that research is funded for a period of time and then we have no more funding. So then trying to find a way, but it's a tool that's now in the department and, and you're on the hook for that with, with no support sort of. So, so finding a way to, and we're actually working on it now, is how do you then transition it to a QI team or the operations team once you've proven that it supports their work and then you kind of hand that off but are still there. But I think it has to be a continuous like work to improve over time. 